Hello, good afternoon and welcome to Midday Live here on TV3. My name is Park Yasare. It's coming to you live from our studios here at Adesawe in Kanda, Accra. And top of the bulletin this hour. Now, fate of residents and traders in Mam will be hanged in a balance following demolition exercise by District Assembly. Also this hour, minority in Parliament demands immediate withdrawal of fresh taxes announced by Finance Minister Ken Furiata. And elsewhere on the international front, at least 18 people have been killed with several injured after a small military plane clashed into a residential area near Pakistani city of Rawalpindi. We've got the very latest details of this and many more stories coming up in the next 60 minutes. We're streaming live on Facebook. You can also join us with your views, comments and suggestions on any of our top stories this hour. We're very active on social media. Our handle is TV3GH on Facebook and on Twitter. Now, the fate of residents and traders on a parcel of land located behind the Mamubi General Hospital hangs in a balance following a demolition exercise. The demolition exercise is said to have been carried out by the Municipal Assembly. My colleague Harry McMenta has more. The demolition exercise residents recalled occurred at dawn while some of them were still asleep. The residents say they were only notified three days ago without talks about any form of compensation to vacate the premises. Some aggrieved residents expressed their displeasure as most of their properties have now been destroyed. We have fitters here and people too are living here. We have containers around this area and people are trading over here. So at least if you want to move the people from here, you talk to them. There should be a round sitting table discussion with them that this is what we want to do. Then you find a place for them. Not knowing, you see, I catch a assembly man. April, you know, Baba Mecca. They said they had notified the assembly man since April, but he told us only three days ago. They told us we will be given one year in compensation, but nothing has been said about it. In the meantime, residents and traders are trying to gather the little they can out of what is left of their property. A resident, Joanna Avode, alleged the assemblyman had even collected money from them to secure an extension of time, but to no avail. The assemblyman took almost 60 cities from everyone to plead for extension of the demolition. As at now, we can't get in touch with any of the leaders. The demolition exercise is said to have taken place in order to establish a municipal assembly office. In other news, the minority in parliament is demanding the immediate withdrawal of fresh taxes announced by Finance Minister Ken Oforiata. At the media budget review, government, while abolishing the luxury vehicle tax introduced in 90 pesos per gallon tax on petrol and diesel, as well as the increment of communication service tax from 6% to 9%. But at a press conference by the minority, uh, the former Deputy Power Minister and Yape Kosu, uh, Kusuga MP John Jinapo said Ghanaians will be compelled to agitate against the proposed increment. Ranking member and minority spokesperson in, on finance, uh, Keselato Forsen, says the media budget review is just another hardship on Ghanaians. Given the fiscal challenges and confrontations, the country and the high level of public debt, it would not come as a surprise if Ghana seeks a bailout from the IMF less than two years after exiting a similar program, a, a similar program that the current administration proudly touted as an achievement. The media budget clearly showed that the public, finance, the public finances are in dire straits and the results 
to additional tax measures is an indication of the troubling times that we are in as we speak. We call on the government to immediately, as a matter of urgency, withdraw these obnoxious increments and ensure that the people of Ghana enjoy some relief. If they fail to do so, we shall use whatever legitimate means possible, both in and out of parliament, to compel them to do so. All right, so we're going to stay a while longer on the subject. It's a developing story, and there's been a lot of attention and focus on yesterday's budget presentation by Finance Minister Ken Ferretta. I'm joined in the studio by uh, Parkway Sisechi um, Anamwa, who is Executive Director of the Institute of Energy Security. Uh, PK, thank you very much for your time, and good to have you in studio. So a number of issues uh, came up yesterday, four key ones. We heard about the introduction of the, uh, the an increment in the communication service tax, the scrapping of the luxury vehicle vehicle tax, uh, the scrapping also or the cancellation of uh, power purchase agreements uh, that were contracted under the s well and DC administration. Let's focus on the scrapping of this uh, PPAs as mentioned by the finance minister. It appears government is quite agitated uh, by what it describes as obnoxious uh, contract signed under the s well administration. What do you make of it? Thank you very much, Bakwesi, and good afternoon to you and your viewers. Mm. Well, I listened to the minister yesterday. I realized that it was simplistic on some of the issues. When you look at our installed capacity, he indicated that we have 5,000 megawatts installed. Mm. Peak demand of about 2,700. Right, so we've got an excess of about... 2,300. Mm. That's quite simplistic. Mm. This is not how it works. Really? No engineering system works 100% efficient. And so he should have looked at the dependable capacity. The installed capacity is 5,000 megawatts. How much can we rely on for the machinery to deliver? So pay your analysis, what will be the dependable the capacity? 4,600. There's still, a, 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 there's still a, an excess. Good, so let's go in there. Mm. Um, 4,600. Mm. The peak demand of 2,700 megawatts suggests that this is the highest demand we have ever recorded. Mm. It can change tomorrow. Anytime you have peak demand, you put a reserve of 20% mm. there mm. because any of the system could have shocks. Mm. The hydro system, any of them can go off. Thermal plants, one or two can go off at the same time. We've encountered this several times in, in Ghana. And 20% uh, margin is somewhere around 500 thereabouts. Mm. And so what you need to base your calculation on is about 3,300 megawatts. Mr. Mr. Um, until this contingencies or care mm. what is for a fact is that we're paying we're having to pay an annual amount of 500 million dollars on on energy that we're not we're not using exactly we'll, we'll come to the point mm. take your 3300 out of the 4600 dependable capacity mm. you have excess capacity mm. for 3300 megawatts right. what happened to this we had plans to export some of this um uh, excess power mm. to neighboring countries but our prices today, are not competitive. Speak, you know, you and I know today, that the prices speak, are not competitive. Today, as we speak, mm. the work that Grigo needs to do to ensure, remember our good president last year mm. indicated that we are ready to export. Mm. Okay. Right. Though the prices are not competitive. Yeah. He made a clear indication. Right. Why hasn't Grigo finished their work mm. on some of the main lines mm. for, for the lack of cash? Mm. It sits there. Mm. The good news is that in sub-Saharan Africa, we are the second country that the highest um, uh, penetration of electricity or asset to electricity over the past two and a half years uh, we used to grow at five percent uh, per annum for assets to electricity for the past two and a half years we've done just less than one percent and so our rural electrification if we deepen it it will take part of this thousand three hundred but until all these things you're talking about happen what remains a fact is that we're having to pay in excess of four hundred million dollars annually for power not used. For power not used. And we, we have what is used? the solution? That's what so we need. So the solution is yeah. government should dip in its industrialization drive. Mm. It will take some of the power. So, off. so you think that the cancellation? I mean, just just a mere cancellation of these PPAs is, is so simplistic. No, because let's separate them. Mm. What we have, mm. the minister is not going to cancel the excess power we have. He's looking the at other PPA. PPAs that have been signed right, right. that are year mark to come on stream right. or for them to start work. Right. Let's halt it. Okay. Let's cancel. You some think of them. that should be this halted? This is what he's saying. It's mm. not the thousand three hundred that is going to cancel. Right. So right. let right. it get yeah. clear. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Are you getting yeah. me? 
So it's 1,300, we should find use for it. Okay. The other PPAs that have not started at all, mm. no construction work has started, you we agree? can defer them, you agree? we can cancel, okay. and there are records to show, like the minister indicated, that for Senate, they have even uh, 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 negotiated with them as to the price and move some from the take or pay to take and pay with other conditions. Uh, it indicated last year they cancelled two um, PPAs and deferred about eight. If there are lessons learned, the others, we can do the same to them. And so let's put the excess power from the, the existing PPAs. Existing PPAs that have not initiated work mm. at all. And so my argument is whatever we have in excess, we should find use for it. Vaco, if they are going to uh, kick in for ports when they start to work, every port demands about 75 megawatts. Mm. So for the four, it's almost about 300 megawatts. Mm. When we dip in our one district, one factory, there will be the need for this. If we want to dip in our access to electricity, rural electrification will have a uh, uh, need of this 1,300. If we now want to continue on when grid cards finish their work to sell some of the power to our neighbors with competitive price though, mm. we'll have need for this 1,300. Okay, let's quickly wrap up with the ESLA levies that have also been uh, increased and uh, the argument by the minority and many other people is that this particular government had criticized quite extensively uh, the, the then finance minister's move to uh, institute the ESLA. What do you make of that as well? Well, that is, that is past. Mm. The criticism was made in the past. Mm. Today, we have ESLA and it's contributing well to all of us to take care of the legacy debts and new ones. Unfortunately, between 1998 to 2017 January, the debt that sits in the books is $2.2 billion. But, but aren't we overburdening the consumer? Because indeed, at the time the ESLA was uh, instituted, uh, petrol prices on the world market were about 40, you know, now it's hoving around a little over 60. The, the minority has a case, though, mm. but I don't want us to be by the point. Mm. I want us to advance right. our arguments to see what will happens to us next time. Mm. Um, now the minister is saying that the, the, the ESLA amount that they used to receive are depleted in value mm. because of inflation mm. and depreciation of the city. Who's making is this? It's government. So it's self-inflicted. Mm. So it's quite unfortunate that they are inaction and mismanagement of the local currency and inflation that has depleted the value of this ESLA amount that goes to the free. You're saying this, this flies in the face of the impressive macroeconomic uh, fundamentals that this government has, you know, been hailed for? Progressy is the minister who made the statement mm. yesterday that the value of ESLA is depleted because of inflation mm. and as well as the position of the state. Right. It's clear in the statement when you read. Mm. And so who's making is this? It's not the making of you and I. Mm. It's not the normal consumer, the ordinary consumer. And so now you want to show up the same revenue that the minority were looking for some years ago. You're also looking for the same revenue mm. and it come at a cost to the consumer, mm. unfortunately. You think it's about time politicians are a bit honest with us when it comes to issues of energy. Why do we keep having to play politics? I mean, one government, uh, you know, sort of criticizes a move by the other, then in opposition, then you come to power and then you want to capitalize on that. Should we begin to, you know, look forward and deal with issues just passionately? We, we felt this was coming. And so if you read our article, in Business and Financial Times, IES articles, on a weekly basis. This Tuesday, or today, we made it clear that it's about time we end petrol politics. They promised something they cannot deliver. The price of finished product or fuel on international market markets is the same everywhere. The US will buy the same, China will buy the same price. Absolutely. The difference between the prices is the taxes and the subsidies applied on these products when they bring them in. Today, if you look at a liter of fuel that you buy, almost 25 to 27% of the price buildup is taxes alone, okay? They should deliver what they promise, and if they, they cannot deliver, they shouldn't promise at all. After all, this is a deregulated market, petroleum market. You have little control. It's either your taxes or you manage your local currency against the US dollar, that's the major currency that we use to buy this product. That's what you need to manage. Government have not managed the CD well against the dollar, Okay, the taxes are too huge to the extent that between 2017 January to now, petrol price has increased by more than 38%. And with this new introduction, we are going more than 40% within a space of two and a half years. Politicians, it is about time that they desist from using fuel price 
as a campaign tool. Thanks very much. Uh, Paco Isi Anamasechi is Executive Director of the Institute of Energy Security. Thank you very much. Meanwhile, government is seeking approval for 6.3 billion CDs as it pushes for a media review of its fiscal policy. Finance Minister Kenneth Oriata addressing Parliament's proposed an increase in some taxes and an abolition of others government introduced in the last budget. He walks in with his usual brown briefcase, sounding biblical. He was emphatic on what exactly he wanted. Fiscal measures are specifically geared towards improving domestic revenue mobilization, reining in expenditures, as well as addressing some critical protracted structural issues in the energy sector. A glimmer of hope for those who protested the imposition of luxury vehicle tax. Government in 2018 introduced a luxury vehicles levy to raise revenue. We have noted suggestions from the general public on the implementation of this tax. And Mr. Speaker, as a listening government, we are proposing to the House the withdrawal of the luxury tax levy. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, continue to improve compliance, expand the tax nets, and explore other innovative sources of raising revenue. Furthermore, the telcos might be revising their notes as government is pushing for an increment in the communications service tax. The government proposes to increase the tax to 9% to develop the foundation for the creation of a viable technology ecosystem in the country from 6%. This will comprise, among others, putting in systems to identify and combat cybercrime, protect users of information, technology, and combat money laundering and other financial crimes. The increase will not be earmarked, however. The sharing ratio will be adjusted in such a manner that the National Youth Employment Program continue to receive the same proportion as they are currently received. With all this, the government is pushing for an additional funds to spend. I beg to move that this House consider and approve an amount of six billion three hundred and seventy million three hundred and fifty five nine hundred and twenty five point eighty two Ghana cities as supplementary estimates to original appropriation of seventy eight million billion seven hundred and seventy one billion eight hundred and thirty three. 600,602.82 Ghana cities to bring the revised total appropriation to 85 billion 142 million 189,527.94 Ghana. While this review of the fiscal policy for 2019 has been referred to the Finance Committee for a report and subsequent debate on the floor before the House rises this week, the Minister of Finance is certain the country is on the right path to recovery. All right, so you're still watching Media Life here on TV3. We're streaming live on Facebook. You can also join us with reviews, comments, and suggestions on any of our top stories this hour. We're very active on social media, handle TV3GH on Facebook and on Twitter. Let's know what you make of the media budget presentation by Finance Minister Ken Oferiata yesterday. Now, as part of the, uh, you know, the presentation yesterday, um, a number of things came up. We knew, we, we got to find out that the finance minister, uh, you know, through government has decided to uh, increase the communication service tax from an initial 6% to 9%. So let me just walk you through what this communication service tax is meant to achieve. Uh, it, help, it, it, it means that, you know, they intend to put in place systems to combat cyber crime, maintain the allocation for national youth employment program, uh, also to tackle other financial crimes, uh, protect users of information technology to combat money laundering as well as putting in place systems to identify and combat uh, cyber crime so these are what constitutes the uh, communication service tax and this is what essentially the money is going to be used for an initial uh, uh, six percent to nine percent increment as mentioned by the finance minister yesterday so we're going to do some analysis on this. Uh, we'll be joined on the phone lines now by the Consumer Protection Agency. Uh, Benjamin Akoto is head of compla uh, complaints unit at the agency and joins me live on the phone. Ben, thank you very much for your time. So uh, first of all, what do you make of the increment in the communication service tax from an initial 6% to 9%? 
flip side we also saw um, a reversal of the luxury vehicle tax policy that was introduced by government last year Could I come again? on the flip side we also saw a reversal of the luxury vehicle tax policy that was uh, introduced by government we know that it received lots of flack from uh, certain interest groups and you know including COPEC uh, and yourself today that policy has been reversed Yes, on the general overview, I think that it's, it's a much reaction because one person has views on one side and others will keep as it is being increased and maybe have it from this side. But then again, there are other sides on the LOT and, and other things that I believe could have, could have been, been done in a different way. As, as a, a, an interest group that uh, considers the interest of consumers, uh, what would this generally mean for the ordinary consumer? For the consumer, an increase in, in time is meaning that the cost will be put down for us to pay. Because the service providers would also not absorb it. They won't absorb it or sort and pass it on to the final consumer. So if, if, if we give you a little bit of time on the top on the shop tax, the, the reason we are doing is that a viable technology ecosystem and for cyber security is that we believe that when we get the basics right, for example, there are still pre-registered some cars on the market. That, of course, would not help in the cyber crime side. So when we get the basics right, like, for example, you, 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 you don't have these cars available for people to be able to have them, then at least we, we are looking at something possible. All right, I've got to say a big thank you to you. Um, Benjamin Akoto is head of uh, Complaints Unit at the Consumer Protection Agency. Thank you very much, sir, for your time. You're still watching Media Life here on TV3. We'll take a short break. Still ahead in the bulletin, we've got international news. We've got the very latest in business news and sports news. Well, this is your election command center, and we continue with our build-up towards the NDC parliamentary primaries on August 24 and the 2020 general elections. Now, the contest is in the Medina constituency, and maybe between two candidates, that's a former NDC youth organizer, Sidi uh, Abubakar, and human rights lawyer, Frances Sosu. But somehow, the former MP Ahmadou Sorogo's alleged attempt to manipulate the electoral process has become a major issue in the campaign. Pen. My colleague Kwacha Frenyama has the rest of the story. Until 2016, it was fair to describe Medina as a safe seat for the NDC. Former Member of Parliament Amadou Sorogo had won every single election here since his creation in 2004. But all that changed in 2016 when the MPP's candidate Boniface Sadiq won convincingly in the parliamentary election. Boniface garnered 54.90% of the votes in that election, while the veteran MP Amadou Sorogo secured 43.13%. A number of reasons were assigned for the embarrassing defeat in the constituency the NDC thought it would always win. Political analysts say, among other things, it was simply because constituents were tired of Mr. Sorogo and wanted a fresh face. Again, the defeat was blamed on the party's inability to forge a united front going into the general election. If the lack of a fresh face on the ticket alone caused the NDC to lose its seat, then the party can heave a sigh of relief as four new faces are seeking to become its parliamentary candidate. Indeed, that will be the first time Amadou Sorogo won't be on the ballot paper. In contention are human rights lawyer Francis Xavier Sosu and former NDC national youth organizer Sidi Abubakar. 
Also in the race are two-time presiding member for the La Nkwantana Medina Assembly, Ibrahim Faisal Fuseni and Rukaya Abubakar. Before leadership of the NDC issued out nomination forms, they charged all aspirants to embark on a campaign devoid of personal attacks. But it appears that will simply not happen in many constituencies across the country, including Medina. Go across the country, look at all the regional youth organizers during CD's time. What did he do? He failed. He failed. So we cannot allow somebody who scored an F at the national level when he was giving the entire country to, to manage, to come, to come and manage Medina. That would be too dangerous to do. Francis Sosu adds that Sidi Abubakar is not known in the constituency. For how many years has he been in Medina? I think that he's even not qualified. When you look at the rules of the... Oh, really? of the, Why? Oh, yes, of course. The rules are very clear mm. that the person should have been very active member at least four years preceding the filing of nomination. Mm. He should show us which branch he belongs to. He should show us his party card in the constituency. He should show us where he used to be. In 2016, he should show us where he voted. He was never part of Medina. This is an opportunistic chance, I believe, that um, I mean, the invisible hand want to impose on Medina again. The private legal practitioner also accuses former MP Amadou Sorgo of scheming to make his preferred candidate, Sidi, win the election. I can see that hand, that invisible hand. I can see it. I see it working in so many ways. But I can assure you that in this primaries, that hand will be broken. It will be taken off. Look, the hands of... Honorable Amadou Surogo will permanently be taking off, his grips will be taking off uh, the Medina constituency. As expected, Sidi Abubakar will not let all these allegations go without a response. Why is he afraid? I mean, if I'm not uh, qualified, you should keep quiet, let the delegates decide. You think he's saying that simply because he, he's afraid? He's losing completely, he's losing, the, he has lost it completely. He has abandoned the seat and was living somewhere in the United States. The former NDC youth organizer says he cannot be blamed for the party's defeat in the 2016 polls. I'm not a failure. I'm telling you that if you could check from my even social media, I am one of the most effective ground troops of the party. I led all the special operations across the country and almost all the places that I was earmarked to operate. I could tell you that we have even those seats that we thought we might not win, and I was assigned. We won almost 80 to 90 percent of them. But does CD truly have the backing of the former MP, Amadou Sorogo? Honorable Sorogo, I, I, I appeal to all of them, including Honorable Sorogo. And Honorable Sorogo, Is he backing you? I ha he has a vote. He's a voter. Is he supporting you? Well, the issue is that he's a voter. I appeal to him. If I appeal to him, maybe in his own reasoning, he felt that CD is the best candidate to support and he's supporting. For now, I did not even hear a word from him that says that he's supporting CD. I'm shocked to hear some of the things that he's saying. He's a bad loser. Sosu is a bad loser. He calls himself the only Zongo boy in the race. Having lived in Medina his entire life, Ibrahim Faisal Fuseni says he understands the concerns of party members and constituents more than any of his opponents. I am a proper Medina boy. If you consider Honorable Boniface, for instance, he was in Medina during the 1988, 89, 1991, 92. I'm part of the guys that he used to send in those days. So Boniface came to Medina as a result of they seeing him as Medina boy. So by that virtue, he was able to, you know, uh, sweep in more votes to his side. Secretary of the constituency, Abdul Razak Hussein, would neither deny nor confirm if Alaji Sorgo is indeed trying to influence the process. He says he should simply take a backseat role. I will expect the former MP as father as he is for the entire constituency for now. If I were him, I would be quiet and silent and leave them, give them the playing grounds. I would want him to keep mute, to leave them, give them the level playing ground. So that at the end of the day, we all go into this as a one family. When TV3 News contacted Amadou Sorogo about the allegations, he declined granting a formal interview, but was quick to rubbish any suggestion that he intends manipulating the electoral process.
All right, so let's do some business news now. And government has attributed the increase in debt stock to the financing requirements for the first quarter of 2019. On the expenditure of programs in the 2019 budget, total expenditures, including arrears, clearance amounted to 34.2 billion CDs for the period compared with the program's target of 36.8 billion CDs. Period January to June amounted to 59.3 billion cities against a target of 60 billion cities. Overall budget balance registered a deficit of 11.7 billion cities, that is 3.9% of GDP, compared to the target of 3.7%. The deficit was financed from both domestic and external sources. Total domestic financing amounted to 8.9 billion, equivalent to 3% of GDP, and constituted 84% of total financing. Foreign financing amounted to 2.7 billion, equivalent to 0.9% of GDP, against a target of 4.7 billion, or 1.6% of GDP. The primary balance recorded a surplus of 4.1 billion, equivalent to 1.4% of GDP, compared to the targeted surplus of 4.2 billion, which is also 1.4% of GDP. Gross public debt in nominal terms stood at 204 billion cities, representing 59.2% of GDP as at the end of June 2019. Mr. Speaker, key expenditures were well contained during the period with the exception of expenses on the use of goods and services, which was 30.1% higher than target, mainly on account of security-related expenses to reinforce our borders. So far, Expenses on the free SHS program and some other government flagship programs have remained on track. According to the finance minister, the external debt stock increased from 50.2% at the end of December 2018 to 52.8% at the end of June 2019. This was mainly driven by the issuance of the Eurobond in March. The sector minister noted debt accumulation is expected to ease and stabilize in subsequent quarters. Meanwhile, Finance Minister Kenneth Oretta has projected an 8.8% economic growth rate for 2019, a rate of 1.4% higher than the World Bank's estimate for the year. Ghana's economy accelerated 8.1% in 2017, driven by the mining and oil sectors, making it the second fastest growing African economy. In addition to the impact of the oil sector, gold output was high, while cocoa production levels remained stable. In 2018, the full-year real GDP growth projection was revised from 6.8% to 5.6% due to the larger base for 2017 because of the rebasing exercise conducted in October 2018. Presenting the media budget review to Parliament, the Minister of Finance, Ken Oforiata, said, growth is pegged at 8.8% in 2019. The key reasons for the shortfall included non-implementation of EPOS, delay in the excise tax stamp policy, lower recorded CI values of imports, non-realization of some program dividends from SOEs, delay in the sale of electromagnetic spectrum, as well as payment of telco license renewal fees. He is optimistic inflation rate would fall to 8%. The deficit was financed from both domestic and external sources, Total domestic financing amounted to 8.9 billion, equivalent to 3% of GDP, and constituted 84% of total financing. Foreign financing amounted to 2.7 billion, equivalent to 0.9% of GDP, against a target of 4.7 billion, or 1.6% of GDP. He maintained the economy is on a prosperous path with the anticipation that interest rates would soon drop to mirror the policy rates and reduction of fiscal deficit to below 5% and the stability of exchange rates. In other news, management of Blue Skies Company wants government to do more to support agricultural production. The company, which is the highest private sector employer in Ghana with about 6,800 staff, says it is disappointed about government seeming neglect of the operations. 
Blue Skies was established in 1997 by British entrepreneur Anthony Powell to produce fresh cast fruits and freshly squeezed juices. In February 1998, with just 35 employees, it dispatched its first consignment of fresh from harvest pineapple bound for the UK's retailer Sainsbury. The company, which currently employs over thousands of workers across Africa, South America and Europe, is a world market leader. We are uh, business people who have a recognition that in business you have a responsibility to also work with the community, not to give back. One has a responsibility actually to do the best one can. It might be using Alistair's skills, you know, to develop the school farm project, which we have 60 schools every year. Management laments the seeming lack of government support towards its operations. My message is allow us to prosper, allow us to get on, encourage us. Boris Johnson was mm -hmm. here spent an hour with us uh, not long ago and we had Tony Blair here. Uh, he's quite a well-known figure, uh, Prime Minister, ex-Prime Minister of UK. Where are the Ghanaian ministers? <laughs> <laughs> We've invited them. We want them to see what we're doing for so we Ghana. Since its establishment in Ghana over two decades ago, the company has been exemplary in corporate governance and creating a conducive working environment for staff and customers. Well, that's all for the very latest in business news. For more business news stories, you can log on to our website www.3news.com. Right, and the chairman of the Ghana Music Rights Organization, Gamro Rex Omar, has alleged that Carlos Sechi KK Kabobo administration misused fans in excess of 2 million CDs. Rex Omar disclosed the board of Gamro is resolute in their quest to retrieve the money, noting it has authorized its lawyers to reclaim all misappropriated fans. The chairman then also turned himself the chief executive so he was supporting to himself he also became the manager the accountant and everything for three years they didn't account to anybody the Carlos Sechi KK Kabobo administration was in charge of the collection society between 2012 and 2014. Kodrenchi and his team took over the leadership baton and handed over to Rex Soma after Kodrenchi declined to contest in open election in 2017. The chairman of the society, Rex Soma, disclosed an audit conducted showed Gamro's funds was dissipated without due process as payments were made without any supporting documents. The amount of 55 thousand was taken from Gamro's account to purchase Toyota Sequoia without any knowledge or approval of then board. Another 51,650 CDs of Gamro's money was taken from the account. They said they were going to use to do ID card for Gamro members. The audit says that they have squandered over 2.1 million Ghana CDs of Gamro's money. Unaccounted for. He noted the board will do everything within its means to retrieve the misused funds. We as Gamro, we have already started our civil action against the people, especially the signatories, Kalosechi, Keke Kabobo, and rest. But we're also asking Attorney General to start a, a criminal prosecution because we cannot accept people just to go and squander people's money and then turn around creating confusion in the industry. All right, so that's it for the very latest in midday news. Came to you live from our studios here at Adesau in Kanda. Right, to win the news, a quick recap of our top headline stories. Fate of residents and traders in Mam will be hanged in a balance following demolition exercise by District Assembly. Also, minority in Parliament demands immediate withdrawal of fresh taxes announced by Finance Minister.
And elsewhere on the international front, at least 18 people have been killed, with several injured after a small military plane crashed into a residential area near the Pakistani city of Rawalpindi. That's all for the news. Thanks very much for watching. For more news, you can log on to our website, www.3news.com. My name is Park Kutiasari. Thanks for watching.